Okay. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you today to Sydney McDermott's thesis defense for her master's thesis work. Uh, and I wanted to give a quick introduction, but also here in the room are her um, very uh, valued and important committee members. So we've got Andrew DeVogelaire, Jim Barry, and Max Grant here. Um, and so all all of this work was because of contributions, um, especially bringing Sydney into the project that got her out to sea. So here's Sydney. Most of my photos of Sydney are of her in a mask because she started in 2020. So we were remote for a good long time before we got to meet in person. And I think I remember when we met, we realized we were the same height, which was sort of a nice moment. It's always that. <laughs> when I met Keenan, it was not like that. We knew. <laughs> um, so Sydney came to us from the University of Maine, where she had a very strong professed interest and love of studying animals and zoology. And there she uh, worked in the lab of Dr. Susan Brawley in phycology. And she also was part of the University of Maine Icelandic Sheep Club, which I think is just the coolest club to exist. Um, was it called U Maine? Is that right, Sydney? Yeah, E-W-E. Excellent. Um, so she was involved there and that community engagement and involvement followed her, uh, as did her uh, love and interest in animals. But when she came here, uh, she was strongly interested in invertebrates. And so um, Sydney came out on a variety of class trips and class cruises where she was always hands on and hands first, touching and grabbing and inspecting what was pulled up. Uh, and uh, she even had uh, an appreciation for her study organisms. Her favorites um, were the pleurobranchia, the opisthobranch slugs. And so uh, she actually named each of them a different type of bread. And so for her defense today in person, we have croissants here, which I'm not sure if that was one of the names, but well, yes, excellent. Yeah. Um, she was also excellent to animal care. So those deep sea animals, we thought when we got them up, we would have to work within a few weeks before they would sort of, um, you know, have a hard time living in the aquarium room. But under Sydney's expert care, they persisted for a long time. And so going out to collect her animals and going out to sea was a really big highlight and something that Sydney was fantastic for. So here she is uh, with Jim Barry and with Fanny Girard, postdoc at Embari. And so um, they went out on the Rachel Carson and Sydney got to be involved in surveying the shipping container, one of the ones that she's gonna tell you about today. Um, she is great at sea. I tend to get seasick. Sydney has sea legs like no other. She functions great on the ship um, and she had a really good field personality where she felt comfortable being out on deck and also uh, sitting in the scientist seat, uh, working with the pilots um, on the ROV. She also very enthusiastically waited to collect the specimens after. So collecting those animals and bringing them back was great. This is for a behavior experiment that you'll hear about, but that behavior experiment also involved a lot of time working with her hands. So under the guidance of the shop folks in the lab, um, uh, Chris Machado taught her how to cut through um, very strong cord and steel uh, shipping container uh, material. And so here she is working with her hands there and then also working up on ladders and in high spaces. And something I wanna point out as you're seeing these pictures is that in almost every one, Sydney's hair color is different. So she's actually polymorphic, sort of like some of her study organisms. Um, and I think peak Sydney was when she went to a conference and she presented and color coordinated her hair to match her poster at WSN. Speaking of WSN, Sydney's a great science communicator as well. So she was very involved in Skype a scientist while she was here at MLML. And she interacted with folks who would visit MLML, including having a strong engagement, uh, sharing what she knows and her knowledge of invertebrates with others and being a really key member in classes. Um, again, being the one with sea legs on a sort of rougher day out at sea. Um, and, uh, Oh, we'll skip that one. I just want to say, and also she was instrumental at uh, the open house, both this year when we had it in person and also in past years when we had to do it virtually. She was the activities coordinator and um, really just, you know, she had her walkie talkie and was running around everywhere, but we couldn't have done it without her. So basically everything that she had at UMaine came through here, really strong 
community engagement, a really important member of the community spirit and bringing people together here. Um, and that love of invertebrates and animals really came through. And I think during her time here, she also developed a strong, maybe not love, but interest in shipping containers. And so when the Ever Given uh, got stuck in the Suez Canal, that was a big deal. It was a big moment where we were, tra Sydney was tracking and sharing with everyone sort of the status of it. And one year after the Ever Given uh, had gotten stuck in the Suez Canal, she brought a um, representation of it with shipping containers uh, to lab meeting, which I just thought was, again, sort of a peak Sydney moment. So now she is at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, where she has actually already begun her PhD program. So I'm very excited that she's going to continue working in deep sea biology with Dr. Craig McLean. Um, and I'm sure that all of those great traits, strong interest in invertebrates and, um, and the deep sea and that community involvement is going to follow her there. So with that, I want to welcome Sydney McDermott, and uh, yeah, let her get started telling you about her research. Thanks, Sydney. Thank you for such a nice introduction, Amanda. I am gonna, oh, there are so many people in this Zoom call. I need you all to go away. Let me share my screen. Much better. Now I can't see anyone. Um, yes, I am so excited to present my master's work to you all. That should be full screen there. Just get everything set up here. I'm so sorry. Okay, so I will be speaking to you today about some impacts of natural and artificial substrates in the deep sea. So we've got a natural substrate over here and then two artificial substrates here. And we'll explore those a little bit. Just as a quick overview, we'll return to this uh, slide a couple times throughout the presentation so that nobody gets lost. But we'll start out with an introduction of some of the ecological concepts that I'm gonna be covering. We'll move into my first chapter, which was the effects of a lost shipping container in the deep sea. And then the second chapter, which looks more specifically into colonization and succession on different natural and artificial substrate types in the deep sea. We'll start off by explaining the concept of succession to you. So succession is basically how species in a community change over time. So in this example, this is a really classic terrestrial example of succession. You see on the far left, there had been a fire that had completely wiped out all life in a community. So you've got bare rock on the far left. Over time, you start to see some pioneer species colonize. So things like those lichens and those small annual plants. Uh, as more time goes on, those will grow and die and build up the soil, which will start to facilitate the appearance of other species. And so you're seeing a major shift over time. You've got these different zones of succession that happen. Um, but succession is not just a terrestrial phenomenon. We also see succession in the deep sea. Um, in the deep sea, rather than having habitat cleared by a fire, like we just saw in the terrestrial example, you tend to see new habitat be introduced. So in this case, we've got a whale fall. So a whale dies and its carcass sinks to the bottom. And instead of seeing the succession of plants, you instead see we start out with some large mobile scavengers that will take care of most of the flesh on the carcass. Once that's done, over a course of months, you see the introduction of these smaller mobile scavengers, these more opportunistic species that will clear the rest of the flesh. More time goes by and you end up with just the bones, which are then being uh, consumed by sulfophilic species, so bacteria and uh, bone worms. Um, and so it's just this idea that over time, your community is going to change and it will change significantly. So we are going to look at some different stages of deep sea succession throughout this presentation. Um, before we hit that, I'd like to introduce the idea of the deep sea to you. So just as a quick definition, the deep sea is anything below the point where light no longer penetrates, which is about 200 meters. So with no sunlight, there is no photosynthesis. So food and carbon primarily come from things like marine snow or like that whale fall that I just showed you. The deep sea makes up the vast majority of the world's oceans. So most of the benthos of the deep sea is soft sediment, about like only about 10% is hard substrate. So things like rock uh, or crusts from deep sea hydrothermal vents. And so these deep sea habitats host very different communities of organisms than their soft sediment counterparts. So over on the left here, you can see some soft sediment habitats you can see that they are really well colonized by things like sea pens, sea whips. Uh, there are a lot of sea cucumbers on soft sediment and then things like these xenophyophores. 
Whereas on the right, you see a hard substrate community here, or several hard substrate communities, where you see a completely different community. In Monterey Bay, in the deep sea of Monterey Bay, we typically see four major groups show up in almost every hard substrate community. So that includes corals, as you see here, sponges, uh, as you see with this crab in this photo, large echinoderms, things like crinoids and large asteroid stars, and small mollusks, specifically snails and bivalves. That doesn't mean that these are the only organisms we see in hard substrate communities in Monterey Bay. As you can see from this image, if this is familiar to anyone who's read my committee member, Jim Berry's excellent work that came out this year on the octopus garden, there are so many different organisms in the deep sea that persist on hard substrate only. Um, but we are going to just keep in mind throughout this presentation, those four groups that I told you. The question is then, what would happen if we added more hard substrate? Remember, it's super rare and it hosts these super unique communities. So I'm going to introduce you to the one Apis. She is a very large container ship, which is not just a description, that is her actual classification, which means that she's capable of carrying between 10,000 and 20,000 containers. Her actual capacity is 14,000 containers, which she's got the majority of that loaded up on her there. And in 2020, her captain sailed into severe weather northwest of Hawaii, rather than going around or waiting it out because they were trying to make their port call in time. And what ended up happening was that severe weather resulted in the loss of 1,816 containers, which was the single worst incident of container loss in the past five years. So what happens when containers fall off of ships? They might wash ashore and they might be recovered, but in the majority of cases, we assume that they sink and they end up in the deep sea. Um, so that would be an addition of more hard substrate into the deep sea. But how big of a problem would this actually be? Just as a quick introduction, we have to ask how many containers are on the world's oceans at any given time. So maritime efforts, both domestic, so within our country and internationally between countries, make up about 90% of global trade. And the vast majority of that is made up of shipping container uh, travel. So all of your holiday shopping that I'm assuming everyone has done, your Amazon packages, there's a good chance that they're being transported in shipping containers at some point. Um, we have really increased the number of containers and container ships that we have available to us. So in a 20 year period, we doubled the number of ships that we had from 22,000 to over 55,000 or 5,500 and 2,200, excuse me. Um, in that same period, we actually increased the number of containers we were able to carry and the number of containers in use by about 600%. So right now at any given time, there are 24.6 million containers in use and the majority of them are on the water. In the map on the right here, you can see the major shipping routes. Um, the color indicates how often those routes are used per year. So the bright yellow routes are used more than 5,000 times per year by those 5,500 ships. Along these paths, we see an average of about 1,300 containers reported lost per year. And notice that I said reported lost. Not every container has to be reported. Um, the legislation as it currently stands says that you must report containers that fall overboard only if more than 50 of them are lost at one time, if they're floating and they pose significant navigational danger to other ships. So containers, as you can see, they tend to float horizontally pretty low in the water. They can be very difficult to see, especially at night, and they will rip a hole in your boat if you hit one. Um, not good. Uh, or if the contents of those containers are hazardous. So we ship a lot of our trash to other countries in containers, or sometimes we ship things like batteries um, or other waste products that are really hazardous. So if those go in, those have to be reported. So it's only in these specific situations. In a lot of other situations, we're assuming that a few containers might be lost at a time from a ship and that just gets written off by insurance. So we don't actually know the true scope of this issue. But even if they do get reported, they're already in the water. What happens next? Containers are capable of floating for upwards of a couple of weeks, depending on how buoyant their contents are and if their watertight seal is still intact. That seal won't last forever. Eventually, it will fail. Um, but while the ship, uh, while the containers are floating, there's a chance that they could be recovered either by a ship, as you see in this image here, or there's a chance that they make it to shore and they wash up. And so that would keep them out of the deep sea. But in a lot of cases, we don't see either of those happen. And instead, we have to assume that eventually that watertight seal will fail or the container is damaged enough from its initial loss 
that it's just going to sink immediately once it hits the water. So once they sink, we have to ask, what are the impacts? So I have this very nice deep sea sponge reef image in the bottom right corner. And my advisor, Dr. Amanda Kahn, some of you may know, she is a super well-known deep sea sponge scientist. So if you were to ask her about deep sea sponge reefs, she would tell you that they are super long lived. It can take hundreds or thousands of years for them to grow to full size like this. And they're super delicate. So they don't do well with disturbance and they don't always recover if you disturb them. If you ask me about them, I would tell you that it would be a real shame if something were to happen to them. So our first potential impact of our lost containers is habitat destruction. If you drop a container, that's a huge amount of surface area that has the potential to crush a super delicate deep sea habitat. But let's say our container landed next to our sponge reef rather than on top of it. What happens then? We would expect to see it be colonized over time. So that might look like this. In this case, you can see that we've got some species from our local habitat. So those would have established from this sponge reef. They would have reproduced. Those larvae would have traveled over, settled, and grown up. But we also have this anemone, which is not from our local species. So our, our next impact is that these containers may act as stepping stones. Um, so a stepping stone community is a small habitat. So in this case, the shipping container acts as the stepping stone habitat. Uh, which some organisms may be able to use to proliferate further and travel to connect or travel to habitats where they previously were not able to establish. So in this case, this anemone was able to reach over to the sponge reef where that species was not uh, previously seen. And there's one more potential impact we have to consider, and that is that the container itself or its contents or the paint on the container may be toxic to the organisms in the environment, and it may just kill off anything on or near it. But we're not actually sure. We would need to study some containers to determine the potential effects before we could say confidently which one of these or which combination of these we would see. Very conveniently, there is one shipping container located in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It's about a day trip out of Moss Landing to go see this container. And back in 2004, Imbari was on a research cruise and found this container completely by accident. They didn't know it was there. It hadn't been reported. So they looked up the serial number. You can see that here. And they contacted the company responsible and they said, hey, did you lose something? And the company actually came back and said, yeah, we actually lost more than just one. So 15 containers were lost within the bounds of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. An additional nine were lost outside of the sanctuary. And to this day, we have only found this one. So we don't know where the other ones are yet. Remember the uh, the mandating report rules, this didn't actually meet any of them. So the contents of this container are not toxic. It's actually full of car tires. Um, no, no more than 50 were lost and they didn't pose a significant navigational damage. So they didn't actually tell anyone. And if Mbari hadn't gone out and found it, we wouldn't have known that it was there. Just as a little um, orientation slide here, this is where the container is located. It is on an area known as Smooth Ridge adjacent to the deep sea uh, submarine canyon that we have here in Monterey. Um, it is a soft sediment habitat. So there is no hard substrate within a 3000 meter area around the container. And then we have a timeline here. So you can see this is, it was lost. And then just a few months later, Inbari found it totally by accident. And since then, uh, my collaborators have facilitated multiple visits to study this container over time. This first visit in 2011 was actually written up and published by Dr. Josie Taylor and her collaborators. And so we're gonna look at her results really quickly because she really set the foundation for this study that I was able to do for my masters. So Dr. Taylor and her group found that the area away from the container on that soft substrate was particularly dominated by sea pens, sea cucumbers, sea whips. This is another sea whip. And then this Neptunia snail. So it's a small, gastropod snail. And you can see that it is not super well colonized. Things are pretty spread out on the soft sediment. And then on the container, they found a completely different community. So they saw these big, beautiful tube worms. They saw scallops. They saw a different type of snail. And they saw a lot of tunicates. And you can see that this is very well colonized in comparison to that soft substrate that I showed you. So my thesis, part of it, this first chapter, Effects of a Lost Shipping Container in the Deep Sea, expands on what Dr. Taylor and her collaborators did. So I analyzed three more years of video of the container 
And with multiple years of this container, we were able to see how the community changed over time. I will note that since it is just one container, a lot of this data is going to end up being qualitative rather than quantitative. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. So the question that I was asking was, how does the community on this lost container change over time? We were able to answer that question. So this is how we did our surveys. We have over nine hours of video that was collected by remotely operated vehicle. This is the Ventana. She's one of the ROVs that we used. And we circled the container multiple times at each year so that we had multiple angles of every face of the container to analyze. We took that video and we identified every organism down to the lowest possible taxonomic unit. Some things we couldn't identify confidently, so they were given a morphotype or a morpho species name. And then from that, we were able to calculate three community metrics, which these will be prevalent throughout the rest of the, the presentation. So we looked at richness, which is the number of species in the community, evenness, which is the relative abundance of each of those species. And we looked at Shannon's diversity index, which is a combination of richness and evenness and gives you a factor of how diverse the community is. We then took it a step further and we looked to see what the most abundant phylum and the most abundant taxa was at each time point. So let's get into it. How did it change over time? This is 2011. This is the data that Dr. Taylor and her collaborators looked at. At this point, we saw the lowest richness, evenness, and diversity compared to the other years. Um, and you will see these little graphs will build on each other each year as we go on. So you can see kind of a visual representation of how those metrics changed. I'm gonna point out this one anemone to you. Uh, keep an eye on it as we move forward through the next few slides. Here's 2013, a few years later. Richness, evenness, and diversity all increased. And here's our little friend again. 2014, you can see that evenness and diversity both increased, but richness did not. Uh, this is likely due to the fact that there was a replacement of two species from the previous year. So two species that were present in 2013 were not seen in 2014, and two species were newly introduced in 2014 that were not there the previous year. And then we get to 2021, where we were, oh, nope, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Let me point out our friend again. Then we get to 2021, where we were very lucky to be able to use a 4K camera. So our, our camera quality is much better this year. Um, we saw the most rich, even, and diverse community. And our little friend is still there. I'm pointing this anemone out to you just to show you again how slowly things progress in the deep sea. So it's a very cold and high pressure environment with very low food and energy input. So metabolic rates for a lot of species are very low. So things don't move very fast, they don't grow very fast, and communities don't always develop at the same rate that we see in shallow water. So let's zoom in on each of those years and see the species that drove those community metrics we saw. Back in 2011, we found that the most abundant single phylum was annelid worms. And that was specifically broken up into two major groups, serpulid worms, which are these white tubes you see here, and sabellid worms, which are the brown tubes. In 2013, we saw a pretty major shift. So those worms were still very abundant, but they had been completely uh, outpaced by one species of cnidarian, which was Tychogastria polaris. So this one species ended up making up more than half of the community. Um, you can see them on the container here, these itty bitty benthic jellyfish. They ended up covering pretty much every surface of the container almost entirely. So there were a couple thousand of them to count. That was a little bit difficult, but we made it through. 2014 was interesting. So we saw annelid worms again as the most abundant phylum, making up 46% of the community. However, remember that the annelids were broken up into two groups. So the single most abundant group ended up actually being the Tychogastria again, which made up more than either of the Sibelid or the Serpulid worms, which are both represented there. And there you can see our little Tychogastria again. 2021 was incredibly interesting because we saw a major change and likely a major successional stage shift. So the worms and the cnidarians had decreased significantly, almost exponentially in some cases. And instead, we saw the prevalence of mollusks take over, making up more than 80% of the community. Most of the molluscan community was made up of these delectopectin scallops. They're very shiny and very pretty. And you can see they actually preferred to be within the corrugations of the container. There is another interesting thing about 2021, which was the introduction of sponges. If you remember from the introduction, I said there were four groups that we typically see on hard substrate communities in Monterey Bay. 
one of those was sponges. Um, and so their presence for the first time in the uh, the first time on the container at this point indicated to us that we may see the community on the container shifting to be more similar to that of a naturally occurring hard substrate community. There's a little bit more evidence for that, uh, for that theory in that we saw the prevalence of those small bivalve mollusks, which was the other group that I mentioned earlier. We're going to look at this a different way. You can see here, this is the abundance. Uh, so the number of individuals within each phyla, color represents the different phyla. So in 2011, we saw the prevalence of those annelid worms. And you see over time, those annelid worms really start to decline in abundance. 2013, all of those tychogastria made up a very large cnidarian dominated community. 2014, we saw that shift again back to annelids, but a lot, a lot of cnidarians still present. And then 2021, that major switch where we saw mollusks dominate. I will also note we did have other species present just in much lower abundances. You can see those there. And I want to point out in particular to you, these are um, echinoderms, which was another one of the groups that I pointed out. Large echinoderms are also commonly seen on hard substrate communities in the deep sea of Monterey Bay. And they actually, they did increase over time. So that's a little bit more evidence towards our theory that we're shifting towards a more natural community. They didn't increase much. There were only 46 of them, but it was more than all the previous years combined. So it was still really interesting to see. Just to sum all of this up, we saw with the rise of the small mollusks uh, and an increase in the large echinoderms and the introduction of sponges, that the invertebrate assemblage on the container is becoming more similar to those assemblages seen on natural hard substrate in the deep sea. The exception to that is that fourth group that I pointed out to you, which is that corals were entirely missing from the container at every time point. We have two theories about that. First, the container, its contents, or the paint on the container could have been toxic to corals, and it just prevented them from settling, and it prevented them from growing on or near the container. Option two is that it may have just been random chance. There may not have been a coral spawning event close enough to the container for those larvae to actually make it there, settle and start growing. Um, if you are interested in more elaboration on those theories and any other observations that we made on the container, our publication is out. Um, it's a publicly available document that was published by the National Marine Sanctuaries Conservation Series. Uh, it was a collaborative work between myself, Jim Barry, Andrew DeVogelaire, and Amanda Kahn. So most of my thesis committee really, really helped with that one. Um, this study was very powerful in that it was a long-term study. It is difficult to get almost two decades of observation in the deep sea, just because the deep sea is a difficult habitat to get to. It takes a long time, it takes a lot of money, and it takes a lot of people involved on ships to pilot ROVs, all of that. So it's difficult for us to conclude just from this one container whether what we saw would actually be true on every lost container. So it left us with a lot more questions than it actually answered. Um, but we can't exactly go drop a bunch of full-size shipping containers in the deep sea. That's not the most scientifically ethical thing. But what we could do and what my collaborators did do was create miniature containers. So this is the second chapter of my thesis. So my collaborators at Imbari and the Sanctuary created these miniature containers to address the replication issue so that we could actually ask questions and answer them with statistical significance. So there are four types of mini containers separated into two groups. As you can see, they were deployed on pallets. So all four containers were represented on every pallet and there were a total of five pallets. So we had 20 mini containers total, five of each type. The first of those types is in our first group, the natural group. This is a sandstone type uh, mini container. It was meant to replicate some of the naturally occurring hard substrate we see in the deep sea. That was the same idea behind the slate-based containers, which you can see over in this corner. Again, it's a natural type. It's meant to replicate rocks. Then we get into the artificial type mini containers. So the first one we're going to look at is the one in this back corner. It's marked with an S. Um, first of all, you can see that it is shaped like a miniature container. It has the corrugations that you see on a regular container. And it's marked with an S because it's painted with a specific type of paint. So commonly in maritime use, you tend to see paints that are anti-rust because unfortunately the seawater is awful for metal. And so you want to coat it with something that will prevent rust. Most anti-rust paints in use have zinc as the active ingredient. 
Zinc also happens to be anti-fouling. So it tends to prevent organisms from settling by being slightly toxic to them. And so the question was then, was the container toxic? So that would have answered our coral question from the previous chapter, um, or was something else going on? And so to answer that, we also have the W type containers here. And those were painted with a water-based paint, which is eco-friendly, doesn't have that zinc and shouldn't be toxic in comparison. So just bringing us back to our overview, we are going to ask how the communities on different substrate types changed over time and see whether there were significant differences in the communities between those substrate types. We're gonna do this a couple different ways. We're gonna look at video surveys, collected samples, and we're going to split our communities into both sessile and mobile organisms. We're gonna start by focusing on the video surveys, as you can see here, and we're gonna ask both questions. We're gonna see change over time, and we're going to see if there's differences in community based on substrate type. Just to orient ourselves one more time, here's that map again. You can see the large container is out significantly further than where the mini containers were deployed, the yellow dot. The large container is down at 1300 meters, so it is very deep, while the mini containers were only located at about 205 meters depth. That is still within our definition of deep sea, but it is much easier to get to, so it was easier to study these. And it has the added benefit of um, with depth, you tend to see slower metabolisms. And so since this is shallower, we were hoping we would see the community develop quicker and see some successional changes in a shorter period of time. And I'll just remind you that it, at that yellow dot, there were five pallets, 20 mini containers deployed. So I said it was a little bit of a shorter experiment because we were hoping with shallower depth, we would see things happen faster. So here's where it fit into the large container study. So you can see the entire large container studies span from 2004 to 2021. At this point, we may continue to survey it. Um, and then the mini container study spanned 2014 to 2019. So they were deployed in 2014 by ROV. You can see the ROV arm here holding the pallet. They were deployed fully assembled. Um, and I have been saying mini container. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a size reference for how many those actually are. So I have the measurements here. Uh, in metric, but I will also give you the volume in uh, maybe a slightly more accessible unit for people who are not deep into science. Each one had a volume of about a cubic foot or around 28 liters. Um, you can see that the surface areas differ a little bit just by the shape, but the volume was pretty much conserved between the different types. I will also point out there are rope handles on each mini container that were used for recovery. We are going to exclude those from our analysis. They do get colonized by different organisms, but they are not the substrates we care about, so we are going to ignore them. We used similar methods as the large containers. So we circled the mini container pallets several times so that I could see them from different angles. Um, and then we did the same thing. We identified down to the lowest taxonomic unit and we calculated the same community metrics. So the first question we're gonna get into, how did communities change over time? Here's 2015, this is one year after deployment. I'm gonna point out some important species as we go. So in this case, we saw delectopectin, which is the exact same scallop that we saw on the large container. And you also see this kind of fuzzy looking bit here. That is the tube building amphipod, JASA. Um, and you will see the JASA community change pretty dramatically over time. So keep an eye out for them. 2016, we saw the community start to, start to develop quite a bit. In this case, you start to see some very important species like these branching bryozoans, which are the fuzzy looking bit you can see on top of this container, or large predatory sea stars like this Stylosterius. There were also basket stars present, Gorgonocephalus in the top left. This is not a Pycnopodia down here. I apologize for any uh, echinoderm enthusiasts. It is actually Rathbanaster, which is the deeper sea species of sun star we have here in California. 2017, another year, in this case, you can really see the community developing, especially that JASA. In this case, we saw some encrusting bryozoans, which are kind of like a second skin on the container you can see here, and these large Stomphia anemones. I'm really, I'm gonna focus in on the JASA again because those mats were so thick at this point. And then in 2019, right before we recovered them, something interesting happened. The JASA is gone. And instead we see these very large crinoids and we see some, another familiar face from the large container. We see serpulid worms. Those were those white worms that we saw on the container at that point. And then we recovered the mini containers. So each one was lifted by that rope handle, placed into a drawstring bag, and that was then closed. 
they were brought up onto deck by the Ventana. And then each one was individually photographed uh, from every side. And then all of the organisms and everything growing on it were scraped off and preserved. And we'll come back to these jars later. They end up being very important. So having looked at over time, now we have to look and see if there was a difference in the communities that formed on the different substrate types. We ended up having to calculate our community metrics a little bit different. So they're the same metrics, richness, evenness, and diversity. But with some of the species present, like those bryozoans or this jassa, it is incredibly difficult to determine what an individual is. So what you would count as one organism. So instead of just trying to count, we decided to use percent cover as a proxy for abundance. In that case, we used a program called PhotoQuad. So I would define out each face of the container and I would drop random points onto it. And we used random point contact to determine the percent cover by the different organisms. So you would go to each of these points individually and you would identify what species it was on top of. And that gave us a good estimation of how prevalent each species was in the community. So we calculated the same metrics for every mini container over time. And because we had replication, we were able to take the average of every type. Um, we ran a repeated measures ANOVA and the associated post hoc test to determine that there ended up being no significant difference in any of the metrics based on type for any time point. But we did see a difference in all of the containers over time. So you can see that here. So this is our richness averaged across all of the mini containers. And you can see it was the most rich in 2019. Here's evenness. You can see evenness was lowest, significantly lower in 2017. And diversity, which was significantly higher than the previous years in 2019. Let's look at that community a different way. This is an NMDS plot. And the way to interpret this is that the closer together points are, the more similar the community was. And so the points here represent every mini container at every time point. The color represents the year and the shape represents the type. And you see clustering, which I have highlighted for you with these ellipses, by color. So we saw that the communities within a year were more similar to themselves than they were to other years. So 2015 is grouped really tightly here. 2019 was also kind of separated from the other years like this, while 2016 and 17 overlapped quite a bit and had very similar communities. Looking at the drivers of this distribution, we saw 2015 was almost entirely driven uh, by how much empty space was present. That was the single most influential factor, which makes sense. 2015, uh, some of the containers were 99% empty space with very little colonization. 2016 and 17, you can see, were primarily driven by the JASA amphipods that you saw in such high abundance. And 2019 was driven by a whole bunch of different species, but especially those big crinoids that we saw. So, the first, uh, we've looked at our video samples and now we collected those containers and we took all of the organisms off of them. And so we had the opportunity to look at that as well to see how the community changed based on the substrate types. So one of the questions I get pretty often when I talk about my work is how accurate are you able to be with video surveys? Which is a totally fair question because some organisms are just really hard to see. And so for fun, I want you to look at this picture. Uh, this was one of the 2019 surveys. And I want you to see how many organisms you can find. I'll give you a second. Look around, see who's there. And here are all of the organisms I found. Um, I had the benefit of having the video surveys rather than a still image, so I was able to see from multiple angles. Um, there's a lot of organisms that are very difficult to see in the deep sea. They're either very small, they move very quickly, or they're very transparent. Um, Video surveys also, uh, just as a function of resolution, it can be difficult to tell similar looking organisms apart. One of these is a clam and one of them is a scallop. I promise I was able to see from the video, uh, but just from the still image, it is nearly impossible to tell them apart. So because we collected the containers, we had the opportunity to look at some of those really small or really transparent organisms. Um, they were collected in 2019. So we are going to assume that everything settled in 2019 so that we can make this comparison, um, which is not a perfect comparison, but it's what we're gonna do moving forward. So here they are being collected. And I will note that this wasn't the perfect solution because we did lose a couple along the way, but we were able to kind of compare with the video surveys and get a good idea of what the quote unquote true community composition was. Here, is some, here are some of the organisms that we saw. 
So we did the same thing. We identified organisms down to the lowest possible unit. They were photographed and all of them were counted by Kayla Arakawa, who was an undergrad researcher who worked with me this past spring. She really, she counted hundreds and hundreds of teeny tiny shrimp for me. And I appreciate that endlessly. Thank you, Kayla. Um, so comparing to the 2019 video survey, we were able to identify to lower levels of taxonomic uh, identification, just because we were able to see more clearly and we were able to actually look at some things for the first time under a microscope. What we found was that there were no new phylum or no new phyla represented in the community. So we were we did a good job with the video, um, but we were able to see more things within those phyla and we were able to identify more specifically. Here's a comparison between the collected community and the 2019 video community. Um, you can see that the metrics are much higher in the preserved community because we were able to see so many more things. Um, but the same trend is preserved. So you'll see the bottom in this case is not year, it's the four types. And in general, you see for the video, there's no significant difference in any of the metrics across the types. That trend is also preserved looking at the preserved community. So that was good. So while we saw a more specific community from the collected organisms, we didn't see a different community than what we saw in the video. Here is just another way of looking at that where you can see one more time that there is no grouping by type. So none of these points are clustered by the same shape in either the video or the preserved community. Um, it was just kind of all of them had similar communities to a certain degree. There were more similar seen in the video surveys. You can see all of the points are clustered closer than they are in the preserved community but there was no significant trend where one type had certain organisms that weren't on another type. So overall, we were able to conclude that we, we captured a really good representation of the community from just the video surveys. And it was really nice to ground truth that with the collected communities. So that brings us to our next question, which is which species were responsible for the distributions we saw from the videos, from the collected samples, uh, from everything? Who was responsible? Here are some of the important species we determined that these were important through um, a permanova analysis with an, a p-value of 0 0.05. So all of these were important drivers of the distributions we saw either from the videos or the preserved community. Um, there are different size classes of organisms represented here. The top left box, those scale bars are five centimeters. The bottom left box, the scale bars are one centimeter. And the rightmost box, those scale bars represent 20 centimeters in length. So you can see we had like multiple orders of magnitude of organisms represented in our communities here. There was something interesting to notice as we looked at which species ended up being drivers of the distribution. And it's that about half of them were highly mobile species. Um, I will note in my definition of mobile here, yes, the JASA amphipods and these anemones are capable of moving. They largely don't move. So we are not going to consider them mobile for these analyses we're going to look primarily at the very mobile organisms. Um, something interesting about mobile organisms is that they don't typically have substrate preferences. And so seeing them in such high abundance in these communities was really interesting. And we had to ask, were they an important driver? Did they have a preference? Um, this is just to show you one more time. This is that initial NMDS plot where we saw the important drivers for each year. And a lot of the species ended up being mobile, only half. Uh, sorry, only half were sessile. So we are going to focus on our sessile organisms to see if there was a difference in the community based only on these ones across the different types. So the easiest way to test this was to just exclude the mobile organisms from our data set, just take them out and run the analysis again, which is what we did. And here you can see another NMDS plot with almost the exact same distribution. So again, we see 2015 kind of off on its own. 2019 separated a little bit from the other years and then an overlap between 2016 and 2017. Um, we also calculated the richness, evenness, and diversity, and we ran our repeated measures ANOVA again. And we found that there was no difference in the community based on substrate type. But again, we saw a difference over time. So likely the sessile organisms were the only ones driving these distributions over time. Despite their abundance, the mobile organisms were not likely the important drivers of diversity in this case. But what were the mobile organisms doing? Um, and specifically, did they have a substrate preference? Were they there because they liked a certain substrate out of the four or was something else going on? 
So we decided to explore that. We repurposed the mini containers. Here's that image Amanda showed of me earlier. This is why we took them apart. So we disassembled them and we used them as substrate tiles that we actually exposed different species to, to monitor their behavior and see if it changed based on which substrate they were on. Those species we collected and observed included Stylosterius, which was that large mobile predatory sea star that I pointed out. Mediaster is another predatory sea star. It is smaller and it is this beautiful bright red color. These are Pagoras hermit crabs. They were very abundant in the collected community and less so in the video surveys, which may be a function of how small they are. Um, but they were both, they were important in both analyses. This is Strongylos centrotus fragilis, the fragile pink sea urchin. They were never actually seen on the containers, but they were very prevalent around the containers at every time point. And so we grabbed them as well to see if there was some repulsive behavior if they hated all of the substrates. And lastly, my very favorite, Pleurobranchia californica, a very large predatory sea slug. And so just as a quick methodology for what we did here, we placed the organisms on the center of the substrates and we monitored their behavior via time-lapse until they left that substrate. Our time-lapse rate was one image every 10 seconds. Um, and we monitored them for the following metrics. We looked at their average speed, their maximum speed, the time they spent on each substrate, and wander, which is a metric that actually Keenan Gillis came up with uh, in my lab here. He, we defined it as the distance an organism traveled, its actual path divided by the hypothetical straight line path from start to finish, which would tell us whether an organism was exploring or if it was displaying escape behavior. Um, to define preference or repulsion, so whether they liked a substrate or they really didn't like it, we looked for changes in behavior on one substrate compared to the other. So if an organism preferred a substrate, we would expect it to move slowly, both on average and maximum, spend more time on that substrate compared to the others, and wander more as it explored. Whereas if an organism disliked a substrate, we would expect it to move much quicker, spend less time, and wander less as it displayed escape behavior, which would be straight line, path just trying to get away. Not every organism is going to perfectly show these behaviors though, and so we are going to define preference or repulsion as having at least two of these metrics met. So either two in this preference category or two in this repulsion category on the same substrate will define a preferential or repulsive behavior. Um, I'm going to show you a couple models before we get into the actual organisms because uh, behavior is messy and these scenarios are gonna be a little bit cleaner and hopefully explain these uh, differences in preference or repulsion a little bit better. So to start off with, if we put a mediaster onto the water-based and then the slate, uh, the slate stone substrate type, we might see them do this. So we saw a little bit more wander on the W type and a little bit slower movement on the slate. But overall, if you did the math, you would find that there is no significant difference in either of our four metrics between these two substrates. So we would say that this species is indifferent to the water-based paint type substrate and the slate type substrate. If we put it onto sandstone instead, we might see something different. We may see it kind of mosey around and explore that substrate nice and slowly before eventually leaving it. And in this case, we found that it had significantly longer time on this substrate compared to the other three and it wandered significantly more. So that meets our criteria for preferential behavior. And one last model here on our solvent-based substrate type, you can see it moved real quick in a very straight line. And so this meets our criteria for repulsive behavior because it had significantly higher maximum speed and significantly lower wander compared to the other substrate types. I'm going to spoil the results for you because the next few slides have a lot to look at. We don't see any preferential behavior or repulsive behavior by any species on any substrate type. So here is our first species, the Stylosterius. You can see them trucking around. They move very quickly, but they move quickly on every substrate type. So there was no significant difference in any of our metrics. Mediaster, that second sea star species, we also saw them move around, but no significant difference in speed, time, or wander on any of the substrate types. Our hermit crabs, Pagoras, they moved incredibly quickly and they wandered a lot, but they did so on every substrate type. So it ends up averaging out to no significant difference in our metrics again. Our urchins, they're a little bit hard to see on the natural substrate types. I promise they're there. Um, 
Again, no significant difference in behavior based on substrate type for them. And finally, our pleurobranchia, my favorite, our big slugs. They had such huge personalities, but no preference or repulsive behavior was observed. So to sum that all up, we saw no significant differences in any metric by any species on any substrate type, meaning that the mobile organisms we studied did not have substrate preferences and they didn't dislike any of the substrates over the others. They were indifferent to all of the substrate types. If that's true, why were they on the mini containers in such high abundance? Why were they there? Most likely they were attracted to the mini containers by the promise of food. So all of those sessile organisms like that JASA you see uh, that settled in earlier successional stages may have facilitated a community that includes these mobile predators by acting as food and attracting them. Scaling up to the mini containers as a whole, just to summarize our conclusions here, we saw a significant difference in community composition over time. So we saw change over time. Back to that idea of succession, we saw a successional stage shift, especially 2019 was very different. But we didn't see those differences between the substrate types. So we saw that our artificial hard substrates hosted super similar communities to the natural hard substrate types. And when they went through successional stages, they did so at the same time, on the same time scale. So it wasn't that the natural types shifted and then the artificial types followed. We saw the same things happen on the same annual time scale. Finally, we concluded that mobile organisms do not exhibit preferential or repulsive behaviors towards these different substrate types. Scaling up to compare to our lost container, in both cases, we saw changes in succession and the community structure over time. We found that artificial materials are not deterrents to the formation of communities, so in both cases, organisms settled on our artificial types. Thank goodness, because otherwise I wouldn't have a thesis. Um, we also saw similarities between natural and artificial hard substrates. So in the mini containers, that was easy to see. They were Those were our experimental types. We were able to analyze them. In the case of the lost container, we had to get into the literature and compare to what was seen on the submarine canyon walls nearby or to seamounts within Monterey Bay as well, which is where we started looking for those four groups to indicate the similarities to a natural substrate community. So sponges, small bivalves and snails, um, corals, which were not present, or large echinoderms, which there's one. And we concluded that these probably could function as stepping stone habitats. So on the mini containers I've highlighted here, this is a little itty bitty baby sea star. Uh, they, like so many organisms in the deep sea, use larval dispersal to spread out and colonize different places. That is the same thing we saw with the sponges here. So if an organism is able to make it as a larva to these hard substrates, settle, grow to reproductive maturity, reproduce, and those larvae then make it to a different hard substrate where they are able to establish, then that artificial substrate, the shipping container in this case, successfully acted as a stepping stone. Scaling up one more time, we do see these trends in all sorts of man-made objects in the deep sea, things like wind turbines in the shallow water, lost uh, shipwrecks, some which are not lost, some have been found, um, but sunken ships, or things like pipelines, oil pipelines, and other man-made objects in, the, in both the deep and shallow water. Um, we see them host unique communities, some of which are very similar to natural communities, some which are different, um, which may be a function of their material type, which gets back into that idea which we had with the lost container that it may be toxic. That may be why we don't see corals, um, because we know that some materials are toxic, especially in the deep sea. The point that I want to make and have you take home from this slide is that this is the Titanic, which went down a very long time ago, and it is still functioning as a, uh, as a substrate that hosts a community. So a lot of man-made objects, including our shipping containers, are not going away. Uh, it can take hundreds or even thousands of years before they would break down to the point where we wouldn't know that that substrate was there anymore. Scaling up, this is the last one, I promise, to the global level. Here's our map, again, of the major shipping routes. And as I speak, you're going to see some points appear. They represent every incidence of container loss that occurred during my time at Moss Landing. So from August, 2020, until the most recent one was last month, I checked this morning, um, which represents more than 7,000 containers that have been lost. So recall that I said, we don't know exactly how many containers are lost because so many of them are not actually reported. This is an ongoing issue and it is cumulative. That was the point from the last slide. These things do not go away. Containers are not going away in the deep sea. 
And so as you add more and more hard substrate into the deep sea, you risk species using them as kind of a highway of stepping stones, which is something that we had shown may be possible. Um, and if we are lining them along these major shipping routes, you may start to see things with unpredictable consequences because we can't monitor them. We may see invasive species using these shipping containers to cross the entire Pacific Ocean Basin. Um, they may act as vectors for disease in the deep sea. Things like uh, sea star wasting could proliferate across these shipping containers if they are close enough together to act as stepping stones. And there are so many other potential impacts that we just have no way of predicting. Um, so just as a take home, we would suggest continued monitoring of our lost container and potentially looking for other containers to monitor to see if we uh, if similar trends are present in different environments. Um, and it's, yeah, just to see if different uh, communities can be hosted on these containers or if they all eventually end up acting like natural hard substrate. I have uh, roughly a billion people to thank and no time to do so, so we're gonna speed run this. First and foremost, Amanda Kahn and the rest of my thesis committee, Drs. Jim Barry, Dr. Amanda, uh, Dr. Andrew DeVogelaire, I'm so sorry, and Dr. Max Grand, thank you all so much for your wisdom and guidance in this project. Thank you to everyone who participated uh, in these projects and made them possible from the captains and crews of the research vessels to the pilots of the ROVs, to Dr. Josie Taylor and her team who wrote that first research paper about the lost container. Uh, and who really set the foundation for the tone of this thesis presentation. Everyone who helped design and deploy the mini containers. I had such wonderful uh, help at Imbari and at Moss Landing, but I wanted to specifically thank Chris, Steve, and the Imbari Video Lab for all of their help as I went through this project. All of my funding sources here, and more people to thank. Um, the entire Con Lab at Moss Landings, uh, special shout outs to, of course, Keenan, Celine, Jacob, Anna, uh, Katrina. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to Kayla Arakawa, my UROC undergraduate researcher who helped me last spring and counted all of the shrimps so I didn't have to. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you to the Geller Lab at Moss Landing who provided me with a lot of support throughout my time there. The entire Moss Landing faculty and facilities teams, it really, none of this would have been possible without you, but special thank you to Diana and Ivano, and a huge thank you to our IT team, especially Misha, who set up this call for me. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the McLean Lab here in Louisiana who have tolerated me talking about shipping containers nonstop for the past few weeks. I really appreciate all of your help and how much you put up with me talking about this. And thank you, of course, to all of my friends, both at Moss Landing and outside of Moss Landing and my family. A uh, huge thank you to my parents, my largest supporters, uh, and to the horde of aunts, uncles, and cousins who have supported me and facilitated my love for the ocean. That's it. Hopefully, oh, I don't know if anyone, we're okay, here. people are still here, okay. I couldn't see anyone. Sorry, sorry, we're good. Thank you. Um, Thank you, everyone, um, and thank you, Sydney. Uh, I think we're happy to open it up to questions. I'll monitor the chat, and but maybe we'll take some in the room in case there's any here first. Yeah, Sarah's got a question. I think that Misha can. Okay. There you go. Awesome. Okay, I have a, a classic faculty two-parter. I'm so excited, Sarah. <laughs> okay, the first question is. Um, about the anem anemone that was on the container that you repeatedly visited. You kept referring to it as a friend, but how do you know it was a friend and not anemone? Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't help myself. I hate myself. That was fake. <laughs> Second question. This is a legitimate question. Um, you refer to succession and kind of that invokes the idea of communities changing over time and you know necessarily you have data points that are spread out by large periods of time and I understand the idea of succession in the deep sea because as a non-deep sea person the um the paradigm that I'm familiar with is that things are relatively stable and that the change that you see over time would be kind of a successional change but some of those events that you see like the big colonizations with you know, one dominant species suggests to me anyway, that there might be kind of episodic or periodic um, events that might not be succession necessarily. 
um, but rather kind of variability introduced. I don't know if it would be seasonal or some other kind of ecological driver. So if you were to, with that in mind, consider a timeline for sampling these um, containers of these hard substrates with only the idea of capturing, you know, the um, change in community on a more kind of resolved basis, what would your dream kind of sampling scheme be? Oh, that's such a good question. So <laughs> because the lost container is so deep, we typically don't see seasonal or seasonality as an influence. And so it wouldn't have to be something that was sampled every month, the way that a shallow water community would have to be sampled to see succession, but definitely repeated um, and very, um, I'm umming quite a bit, repeated visits on a schedule. So you are seeing the same time difference between each one um, and over a huge period of time. That is what I would wanna see. So I would wanna see a visit every like three years for the next 45 years to see what would happen, to see if there were episodic changes or if it was primarily just succession as we think that it may have been. Cool, long thesis. <laughs> She says that will be a long thesis for someone to do. <laughs> that, yeah, that's several master's degrees, but. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions from the crowd? Oh, Jim has got one. I'm so excited. Hi, Jim. Hi, great talk. Really did a great job presenting all of that. So congratulations. Getting back to the succession question, I guess kind of a two-parter, but not nearly as clever. I really <laughs> like the anonymity. That was brilliant. Um, you, you showed these changes on the, particularly on the container, but you didn't really talk about what might be driving those changes. So why are the lectopectin coming up or worms disappearing or on the mini containers, JASA disappearing? What's going on that might've led to those changes? And, and is, can you tell us anything about what's going on in succession? First question. Second okay. question is how long do you think it would take maybe 45 years to see what might be a climax community there in kind of classical succession lingo, or would there even be a climax community? So, okay, first question, um, how, you know, how to explain the changes that we saw. In the mini containers, a lot of what we saw, especially the disappearance of the JASA, we think that was mediated by uh, predation specifically. We think the introduction, not the crinoids, those are not necessarily predators, but we saw so many of the stylosterius, which do eat the JASA amphipods. Um, at one point we collected a few of them and I dissected their stomach contents. Um, and I was able to identify some amphipods in the stomachs of these sea stars. And so we think that at least for the mini containers, a lot of that major change we saw was predatory in nature. On the large container, it's a little bit more difficult because we don't necessarily have the annual sampling that we did with the minis. Um, I think at least with the worms, because their cases would still be present on the container, especially the uh, circulid worms, even if the worms themselves had died off, and the fact that we didn't see them at all in the 2021 community, that may be also indicative of predation. So something came through and it actually cleared them off, which opened up the community, opened up the surface of the container to then be colonized by those delectopectin scallops. The second question, the fun question, um, I had chosen 45 years because we analyzed the mini containers for five years and we saw a pretty, pretty major shift. And if it had continued at that rate, that's where I came up with 45. I was trying to think about how many successional stages would it take before you would get to a dynamically equalized community where you're not seeing any more change over time. Um, it may be significantly longer than that if there are huge predatory events or a huge spawning event like what may have caused the um, Tychogastria event that we saw in 2013. Um, ideally, you would monitor it indefinitely until the container disappeared thousands of years down the line and see what happened the whole time. Uh, but I don't know exactly how long it would take. I'll ask a quick, really quick follow-up. So, um... So maybe it's gonna take decades before there's some sort of stable community. What about an, another hypothesis that what you've seen is already as far as it's going to be in terms of stability? Maybe that could it just continue cycling with episodic events, comings and goings of predators, larval um, colonization episodes? Is that another possibility? It could be um, a concern with, or not necessarily a concern, but something to keep in mind with that is that the container 
while it's in good shape, it won't necessarily stay that way. Eventually that paint is going to flake off. And so then that's a different substrate underneath. That's a different material that's exposed. Um, it may have different properties or texture or any other thing that all of these sessile organisms are attracted to or repulsed from. And so if the container itself changes in that way, even if it was already at a stable state before then, it may no longer be there and it may have to reestablish a stable state that may be different than what we saw previously. Okay, thanks. Do yeah. we have time? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, we've got Andrew coming up next with a question. Okay. First, Sydney, I'd like to, to point out that I did notice that you have shipping container earrings. And Amanda I, made these for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's there are two thoughts that I have about having a fresh, a fresh substratum at the, the bottom of the sea. One of them is you started off your presentation talking about sponges and how old they are. And one of the dramatic things in the study was how all of a sudden sponges showed up and they were relatively large. Um, yes. So that um, is there value in learning about the natural history of sponges in terms of growth rates? And then the second question is right now there's a lot of interest and a lot of money that's going to be going into deep sea coral restoration um, in the sanctuary. And um it's uh, it's striking that there were no corals on the containers. Do you see any value in doing an experiment, whether, whether it's relative to dispersal distance, of putting, transplanting a coral onto something like the container? Okay, the first question. Um, so because Amanda is my advisor and she is the sponge scientist of all sponge scientists, we actually did explore that question a little bit. And so based on the appearance of the sponges and their size, we are pretty sure that they are the same species of glass sponge, Hexactinellida. And we think that they came from the same spawning event based on their size, the uh, diameter of their opening, the oscula. And so we were actually able to, based on other studies that have been done on the growth rates of sponges in the deep sea, determine when we think they settled on the container, which was around 2015. They have an initial a high growth phase which then slows down as they age, which is why those communities take so long to get so large. And so those, we so we did explore that. That's my answer to your first question. And I do think that there's value in exploring that to see when that shift may have occurred, when it may have started. And we think it happened somewhere around 2015. So we just missed it with that last observational period in 2014. As for your second question, I think that there's totally value in transplanting a coral onto either like a clean shipping container material if you wanted to just like do a substrate tile experiment or onto the container itself and seeing if it is able to persist on that substrate to determine whether or not it was that like random stochastic event that there has been no spawning events close enough to actually settle or whether it is actively toxic to them. I'll also note that there were no corals on the mini containers either but no corals on any of the four types which again may indicate that it was just the location of where they were deployed far away from any hard substrate where there were corals previously established which would spawn and then populate those containers. So I think there would be a great value in that. Um, and then you would have an answer to a question that's been bothering me for three years, so. All right, we're running low on time but we have two questions in the chat. So maybe some quick answers and then we will need to wrap up. Um, the first is from Kevin, who asks, what role do you think large mobile animals such as fish or mammals play in introducing new sessile taxa, such as through hitchhiking, or rapidly removing large amounts of colonizers? Cool question. Um, I cannot speak too much to mammals, especially with the lost container, because it is very deep. So it is not a habitat where we typically see a lot of mammalian influence. Um, fish, though, we, de we did see a good amount of fish near the container. And so there definitely is a potential for them to graze the organisms that were on the containers, uh, on the large container or the mini containers, uh, or to potentially bring in new ones. I don't know to what degree that would be. We did not see as many fish even close compared to the number of invertebrates that we saw, which is why we focused on only the invertebrates. Also because Amanda's lab is the invertebrate ecology lab. Uh, so I, I definitely think it's a potential source of both uh, immigration to the containers and uh, a source of predation removing them from the containers, but I don't think it was a major source of either implants or explants 
within the community. Okay, last question from Alex. Uh, over the course of the studies, did the lost containers or mini containers show any sign of degradation? I know that they take a very long time to degrade, but was there any signs of the start of that process? Yes, so what we saw was actually the beginning of rust forming between the container and its paint. So that was visible, especially with the 4K camera in 2021. Um, we were able to see the paint starting to bubble away from the container. Um, and further research showed that that was a sign of rust formation. And so the container is very, very slowly starting to break down and rust away. That'll take decades and decades to actually get to nothing, but it is a process that we have seen starting. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, everybody, please uh, feel free to turn on your mics on, or sorry, your um, your cameras on Zoom if you wanna clap and we'll thank Sydney. Oh, there's so many people. Thank you all so much for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Oh, all right, great. Well, thanks so much. We're gonna close out this Zoom call and Sydney, we're gonna hop you over to another Zoom call to chat with you after as a thesis committee. Yes, I'm uh, excited. Yeah, but thank you all so much for coming and uh, great job, Sydney. I believe two different Zoom calls now. <laughs> Shall I hang up?